very foundation on which everything that you stand, that is the very foundation, is that covenant that we have. The Word of God was birthed out of covenant with God. We've talked about this laying a foundation from one thing to another, and we started all the way from the very beginning of time. We went through the cross. We talked last week a lot about the things that took place on the cross, about what it is. I, I want to show you something today that I think is very important in this area. As all of you should know, we have, there are two covenants that we have. There's two covenants. One is the covenant of circumcision with Abraham. That was God's access to man. That gave man the opportunity to bring God into his stuff. How many of you like to have God involved in your stuff? It's true. You get in a problem, I'll tell you, there's nothing in the world like saying, Lord Jesus, help me. I need God to be in my stuff, my business. Uh, some of us are professional troublemakers, and we get into things that we shouldn't get into. We open doors we shouldn't. We make business deals that we shouldn't. We need God to be involved in those things. So this first covenant was the covenant of circumcision with Abram, Abraham, and the new covenant that we have is with Christ. And this one is to equip us in ways that the old covenant could not. To sustain us in our new birth, our stewardship on this earth. And I jotted this down here of what the covenant provides for us. And I want you to, maybe you can jot these things down or some of you just have a mind like a steel trap. You don't even need to write it down. You'll remember it. What does our covenant provide for us? What is our will? This last will and testament, what does it provide for us? It provides identity. It provides access. It provides tools to function. And it provides empowerment. Now I want to say it again. That's what you should expect in your daily life from the covenant that you have with God. You should expect identity. He's going to change your identity. You have a position that you didn't have before. So this covenant with God gives me identity. You know, it's kind of like the sons of Sceva. They went to cast the devil out of that man, and he said, Jesus I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? And it said that guy with the devil jumped on all of those boys and just whipped them all and run them out of the house. But the devil knew Jesus and the devil knew Paul. There's an identity that you should have as a believer and walking in covenant. Access. I have access into the kingdom of God that I didn't have before. I have tools to function. I have the name of Jesus, the authority of the Word of God. I have the shield of faith. I have my feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I have, I have angels at my beck and call. I have tools that I need no matter what I get into. I have tools that are there and I have empowerment. So you have to understand there's a difference between a policeman that stands on the corner and says stop to cars. Now he has authority to do that, but he's not really all that empowered to do that. They can run right over him. You know that's true? But you put that policeman in a tank and set him on the corner and all of a sudden now he's not just operating with authority because certainly he has the city and the state and the country. Every Marine is at his call. But see himself now, he's empowered because he has something within him. That's you. So you have identity through this covenant, access, tools to function, and empowerment. 
And just for perspective, I want you to understand, and I'm lay this out because I want you to see where we're going with this. Everything that Jesus did was in the Old Testament. The Old Testament did not start until the book of Acts. And Jesus' time, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were still going to the temple to Passover. People were still going to offer sacrifices. That was Old Testament. Everything that took place in the, in the four Gospels actually was still operating under that, that Old Testament. But during the New Testament, something changed. There was a change in the Spirit of God, His position, and in your position. And that's so very important. As a matter of fact, sacrifices were made every year to this point that Jesus was the last sacrifice that was offered under the Old Testament. The last sacrifice that was offered was the Lamb of God. Amen. So I want you to understand that there was a transition that took place from the time of Jesus to the time of the apostles in the book of Acts. Actually, it should be the Acts of the Holy Ghost and not the Acts of the Apostles. So there was a bridge that, that enabled us to cross this divide to God. Man could not know what it was to be born again. They didn't know what it was to truly be empowered except through Jesus Christ. They didn't know what that was. But God caused the bridge, the Lord Jesus, to bring us into a better covenant than what was there. And when Jesus said, it is finished, that meant he completed the demands that were on the old covenant. All of the demands that man could not fu fulfill, Jesus fulfilled. And so he completed the demands of the Old Testament or the old covenant and now Jesus initiates the new covenant, and he has sealed it in his blood. And that's very important. So, that being said, because I want you to know now that we are moving from an old covenant into a new covenant. A lot of people have the idea that the old covenant, Jesus did away with it, but he didn't. Jesus fulfilled that. He he. He fulfilled it. He did what was necessary. And he sat down and he provided his will for us, his, his, this, this will that he left us. The articles of God's covenant to us are found in 66 books of this Bible. The articles of covenant. See, a lot of people, they don't know what's, what's in there. But it's in these 66 books. And Jesus was the amendment to the first one, not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Do you remember what Jesus talked about that? Matthew 5, 17, he made this statement. He said, think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've come not to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, he didn't replace it, but he fulfilled its demands. And he made a better covenant based on better promises, is what Hebrews chapter 8 said to us. So there's not going to be any more sacrifices because Jesus is our sacrifice. No more need to obtain righteousness because Jesus is our righteousness. Amen. He is our wisdom. He is our sanctification. Everything that we need is wrapped up in this covenant in Jesus Christ. Now, I have promises from that first covenant that I still hold to every day. I, and maybe this is a little bit minute, but I think it's important that you get to this. Jesus didn't do away with that. I still have things in the old covenant that I draw from every day. I draw from both covenants. But the penalty of death that was on the first covenant was poured out on Christ. And so the blessings of the first covenant still remain in my life. All of that good stuff still remains. 
Don't you remember what the Bible said in Deuteronomy chapter 28? I'll bless you coming in. I'll bless you going. Don't you think that I don't still rely on that? I'm going to bless you in the store. I'm going to bless you in all you put your hands to. See, that was the promise of the old covenant. It wasn't done away with. It's just that the demands and the penalty of that fell upon Christ. But it still remains. Galatians 3.29 said, If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, all throughout that old covenant, God gave us promises. I mean, can you think of some of the promises that you flip over in the book of Psalms? or in the book of Genesis, or in the book of Deuteronomy, or any of those books that you go to? How many times have we gone to the Old Testament and we're standing in Isaiah and we're declaring what God said in Isaiah? Well, that, that is a covenant that God made with Abraham that's not going to be eliminated. I'm a child of Abraham. It's just that the penalty of that old covenant fell on Christ, but the promises still remain in my life. Does that make any sense to you? Because in our minds, there's been this mental divide that the old covenant don't even work anymore. I, I read so many promises out of the old covenant that I still draw from. And Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. I came to fulfill its demands. All of the things that were pulling at mankind that he couldn't do, I did. All of the judgment that was falling on mankind, I fulfilled. It fell on me. And the promises of God still remains on your life. And I look to that old, I find in that old covenant, I find refuge. I find fortress. I find, I find deliverance. I, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into the book of Psalms and I read things that, that, that spoke to my spirit. It's still alive on the inside of me. I, I, come on, widen your thinking for just a moment. Make sure that you're not missing out because you've been lied to about what God was providing for you. See, the first one gave access to God. It gave protection. It gave provision. But the second one gave entrance into the new birth and into the kingdom of God in a way that the first one could not. But both of them are essential. Both of them are important for you. And so Jesus, when he came, he, he had got, mankind was separated from God. The penalty of that first covenant, the penalty of the law could not be, there wasn't any of us, could, we couldn't carry it out. But the Messiah came. That's why it's so important that Jesus be crucified because Jesus bore it all. Remember, I, I told you this last week. He said, if I be lifted up, Everybody knows that scripture. I'll draw all men to me. Well, that's the King James Version, but that word men there is in italics. They did not know how to translate that. Look at that. Men is in italics. See, but if you will look at the context, he's not talking about drawing all men. He's talking about judgment. And Jesus was saying that if I be lifted up like a lightning rod, I'll draw all the judgment of God to me. All the judgment that was on mankind fell on Christ. I hate to just wear out a scripture to you, but 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin became sin. How did he become sin? Because all of the judgment of God that was on Jerry Edmund fell on him. All of the judgment that was on royal poor, all of the things that he deserved fell on Christ. All the things that I was, he became. Can you imagine that? <laughs> when, when the Bible said he was marred like no other man was, what would cause that? There were thousands of people crucified. Somebody say, well, they pulled out his beard. No, no, no. Listen, the Bible said he was marred more than any other man. How can that be? There was a lot of people that were nailed to a tree, a lot of people that had been scourged. 
What would cause someone to be marred to the point that it made the reference like no other man? The reason is, is because what he took on and became. Have you ever seen someone that was hardened by sin? Have you ever been around someone like that? You can see it in their face. It twists them. It shapes them. Can you imagine that the penalty of every man, of the very sin nature itself, falling on Christ, don't you think that caused, if I could use this word, a tremendous sense of deformity in his face, on his body? My God, what, what must that have been like? That when Jesus said, Father, if, if it possible, let this cup pass from me. What cup's he talking about? Just being crucified? Thousands of people were crucified. That was more than that. It was the separation from God and the penalty of all mankind from the very beginning to the very end. Your great-grandchildren that is not even born yet, Jesus bore their guilt. I get so, I don't want to say tickled, but it ain't even funny how people are so determined to have the attitude that God's going to get you for that. He already got me. Where did he get me? At the cross. <laughs> God's in a really good mood. God's not out to get anyone. Oh, come on. It's the truth. You, you, people don't appreciate how much was poured out on the Lord Jesus when he said, It is finished. My God. So powerful was that moment. So powerful. And the bridge that, that was missing from us and the Father suddenly was manifest in the form of the Son of God. And my access to God, and listen, it's not some little tiny rickety bridge. It's a six-lane highway. <laughs> it's, it's not His will that any perish, but that all come to repentance. God's, God's made a way for everybody. God's not trying to keep you out. God's not trying to, can I just tell you this? He knows where you sleep. If God wanted to get you, he knows where you are. Well, that's the truth. So that's what Jesus did for us. That's what he did. So, but it didn't stop there because so many times we stop there and we fail to realize the next step. What happened after the cross? What happened after the resurrection? Well, that's where he began to take his blood and took it and presented it to the Father and put his blood on the mercy seat. He was the sacrifice, again, the last sacrifice that was offered upon the altar of, of our need for peace with God. So after, after the resurrection, the details were done. Jesus went to the holy place. He made the transactions. And, and I, want to, I want to just I jot down a couple of things because I think it's real important how I give this to you. This is the legal aspect that most people don't see. There were things that took place that you and I just said, well, thank you, Jesus, and we just walked into the blessing. But there was a lot of legal transactions that were taking place during that time. Uh, every one of you know it. If you've ever dealt with a lawyer, if you've ever dealt with a real estate agent, what they'll do is, is they'll take care of all the paperwork and the transactions. And they'll bring you in, set you at a table and say, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here, please put your initials there, put your initials here, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here. And that does it for about 15 minutes. But then they say, okay, go wait at Chili's and I'll call you when we're done. And you, you don't know all that took place while you were at Chili's. 
<laughs> you, you don't, and, and, and Jesus did his thing, and I just walked into the blessings of God, and he did all of the work for me. So I want to expand your thinking for a moment about what a covenant is. And I want you to please listen to me. Now, sometimes when you start talking about this, you look at people because their eyes will glaze over and roll into the back of their head. But I need you to stay in the game with me for just about three minutes because I want to I want to read you a couple of things that's very important for you to understand. This covenant that we have is a will or a testament. Now, let me read this description. A will is something, a will, a testament is a will, and for there to be a testament, there must be a testator or one who makes and executes a last will and testament. The testator establishes the testament and vouches that is true. A testator appoints an executor who is given the job of carrying out the terms of the testament. An executor is alive when the testator establishes will. His job begins when the testator leaves the earthly realm. Ex executor means a person to whom by a the testator has appointed and confided in. An executor is named in a will and derives his authority from the will and carries out the terms of the will. Okay? Now, I don't know that I probably explained that right. Elizabeth is here. She can straighten it out for you. But there are certain things that take place when a will is laid out and carried out. I, I hope all of you have your will in place. Your children depend on the inheritance of your life that's part of the baton that is passed to the next generation. That's how strength is built in a family. It's how wealth is built in a family. It's true. You should pass something to your children. That's, that's important. Okay, now Hebrews 9 says this. Hebrews 9 tells of the heavenly sanctuary and Christ, look at this, as the high priest, the maker, mediator, executor, and minister of the new covenant. By shedding his blood, Christ enacted this deed of the will, and through his death, he left the title deed to us as a will or as a testament. I'm going to read you uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 and 17. Here's what it says. Now, I don't know, I, you, let me see if I've got the same thing for where, for, for where there's a testament. Well, let's just do verse, this is the Amplified. The reason I say that is I've been farming around with so many translations, I get lost sometimes. For where there is a will and a testament involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will and testament takes effect only at death, since it is never in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Now, that is very important. Now, uh, the covenant that we have, that we understand, is an agreement made by a giver, which is in effect while he is alive, while the testament is a will. When the maker of the covenant dies, the covenant comes into effect as a will. By shedding his blood and dying, Christ signed the title deed and left it to us as a will. Because the maker of the will died, we have legal and judicial right to claim what is in the will. That's very important. And an interesting point here, with a will and testament, there is a need for an executor or someone who is in charge to make sure that the terms and the conditions are communicated and carried out. Someone who will make sure the heir knows what is theirs and make sure that they know the provision that has been made for their inheritance. 
after, and I love this, after resurrecting and ascending into the heavens, Christ became the executor. Now, first he wrote out the will, he died, now he's going to rise from the dead and make sure the will's carried out the way he wanted it to be done. So now he's the executor in the court, in the heavenly court. Christ is not only the maker of the covenant and the giver of the will, he is now the executor. And by shedding his blood, he enacts the covenant, and by dying, he activated the will and testament, and in resurrection and ascension, he is today the executor of this will in the heavenly courts of God. Now, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. I'm going to read this. If this shows up as another translation there, just take them both in, okay? Hebrews 8, 6 says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he also is the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted upon better promises. And 9.15 of Hebrews. And because of this, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Christ, as the mediator of a better covenant, is the arbiter and the, and the executor of the will. Okay, that being said, let me say this. After signing the title deed in his death and leaving it to us as a will, he resurrected and he ascended into the heavens as the executor to execute what is mentioned in this will. And I want to say this, if you can open your heart to it. In a sense, you, as the body of Christ, are also executors of, of his will on this earth. Now that's very important for you. We demand that everything is carried out as he intended. There are a lot of people who will say, well, healing's not for today. Don't tell me that. As an executor, I'm going to defend the boundaries of what he intended for me. So in that sense, he is the executor in the heavenlies, and we as his body become the executors in this earth today. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Whatever we ask according to his will, he hears us. Can I just say this to you, and I want you to please listen to me because that is a scripture that has probably been butchered as much as any scripture in the Bible. His will isn't his mood or his feelings at the time about a specific situation on a specific day. His will is his word. Come on now. His will is His Word. That's what's been given you in this transaction. I stand up and I know what the will of God is. Well, let me just read that scripture to you because I know a lot of you have heard people misquote it and misuse that many times. They don't ever misquote it, they just misuse it. This is in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. I'm even going to give it to you out of the King James Version because I know you'll know that that's closer to God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. This is His will. Well, you never know what God's will is. No! Who said that? See, that's somebody that don't ever open their Bible. They don't know what his will is. His will said this about that situation. His will said that about that situation. And he said there, and this is the confidence. Man, I've got confidence. Almost just a little bit arrogant about it. Don't tell me it ain't for me. Come on now. 
See, some, that, that's a problem with some of you guys. Some of, sometimes we just get so passive, well, you never know what God's will is. You chicken. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a word. I can't think of one that's appropriate right now. My heart's bigger than my mouth right now. I'm, I feel something, and I ain't sure how to say it. I, I want you to know that it doesn't matter what somebody says God is, God isn't. Well, this, he laid out, he didn't change his mind. What's in the Word? Well, well you don't know what God, don't tell me I don't know what. I have his will. He, this was written. The Bible said that the Scripture was as men were moved on by the Holy Ghost. They wrote it down. Man, I'm telling you, when David was moved on by the Holy Ghost, and he wrote it down, and when I read it, I'm moved on by the Holy Ghost, just like he was when he wrote it down. That anointing that rested on him when he wrote it rests on me when I read it. <laughs> And the enemy says, it don't work. Oh, shut up. It does work. It does. It says, God's always waiting on your response to initiate and be the executor of his will in this earth. And one of the greatest things that weakens us is becoming double-minded. Read the book of James. It'll tell you about being double-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in everything. The Amplified says, in everything that he thinks and feels and decides. Well, I'm saved. Well, I'm not saved. Well, I'm saved. Well, I'm not saved. You know, <laughs> I, I don't care how you feel. What do you believe? Where, where have you come to the place that you become uncompromised in what God said to you? Where have you come to the place that, like Abraham, that you, you chose not to look at your circumstances, but you chose to believe God? The Bible said in the book of Romans chapter 4, said Abraham considered not his body, which was now dead, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Both of them were 100 years old. You talk about circumstances, well, it doesn't look right. Of course it don't look right. Everything around you don't look right. Can I remind you of this? We are in an earth curse system where everything is dying. You're, you're going to have to be, what's that fish that swims its entire life upstream? That's where we are. We're fighting against the current. What current of what? The current of death. The current of disbelief. The current of accusations. The current of how I feel. For you to engage the world of the Spirit and through that last will and testament bring the bread of heaven into our earth curse system, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to stand on that word. You're going to have to do like Abraham. I'm believing God. I'm believing God. Let's call him Abraham when he was not Abraham, the father of many nations. But he still, he took it on himself. He took the name for himself. What name have you taken on for yourself? What do you believe about yourself? See, you can come in here and say, woo, praise God, and quote a couple of scriptures, but when you get out there and suddenly you're looking at the circumstances that are literally impossible, how do you, how do you respond to those things? See, that's where you are. That's where you are. And his will, what is his will about healing? Well, you never know. Well, I have to go back to what he said. I, I have to go back to what he said. The, that's why we make the statement that the Word of God is the final authority in my life. There comes a point where you break through. 
there was a breakthrough. I, I, I don't know how to explain that. I've given reference to this before, but the old timers used to call it praying through. I made fun of them for years, but then I found out they were right. <laughs> there, there's a point to where you pray until you break through the wall. You break through the hardness. You, you break through into somehow a realm of faith, of rhema word to where I don't care what I see. I know, I know, I know, and I, I will never move off of that because God said that to me. What's his will about deliverance? What's his will about blessing? Well, you never know what his will is. To some people, you know, they're just not supposed to be blessed like that. And, and you, you live a life to where when you then approach God, you're so blooming uncertain, you don't even know how to approach him. If I can say something this week that I said briefly, I promise, just, but this is why people can't approach God with boldness because they don't think they belong there. Boldness is not seen in ripping the wall, the door off the wall. Boldness, that doesn't mean being loud. Again, if I can use this example, I'm bold to my house because I belong there. I don't have to ask permission. I don't even think about it. When, when you went home yesterday, did you think about it? Did you think about it when you well, walking in of, of a little uncertainty? No, you just walked in the door. You did. You got in the refrigerator. You didn't ask anybody's permission because you belong there. You, I, I might not have that same feeling if I went to your house. I might hesitate because I don't belong there. And we've got this weird idea that we don't know where we belong. Can you imagine? And, and this is how we've been <laughs> as children. Can you imagine one of your children coming to you and saying, Now, Father, Mother, This is really what I need. And, and I, I really don't know if it's your will, but I'm asking that if it's okay, if, if it's okay with you, if it's all right with you, now, and I don't want to put too much pressure on, and I know you've got a lot of things going on, but if I could just have a drink of water, but not my will, not my will, not my will, but yours be done, you know what you're going to say? You're going to say, boy, we're going to get you some help. You would, but that's exactly what we do with God. So, somebody say, Jesus prayed that. <laughs> yeah, he did pray that, but it wasn't the same. Jesus was dealing with separation from God. And he's and inside he's going, Father, I don't want that. But whatever you want for me, that's what I want. That's not the same as us coming in and praying. God, I want your will. What's your will? Your word is your will. Your word, what you put in this last will and testament is, is set in the, in the cornerstone of heaven that when I bind it on this earth, that it's done in heaven. When I say it on this earth, heaven comes to attention. I belong there. And as a result, I come before the throne of grace not apologetically, but I come with boldness. I belong here. Don't tell me I belong. I, I have as much right to the throne of grace as Jesus does. He has no more right to be there than I do. Now, that's tough on you whenever you've been feeling your whole life like you're just an old sinner saved by grace and a dog that nobody wants. I'm not there in my righteousness. I am in his righteousness. I'm in Christ. That's why it's so important. So the will has been laid out for me. So I can say, uh, I, I pray according to the will of God. I'm going to find out what that will said to me. And if I pray according to the will of God, it says he hears me. And I know if he hears me, I know that I have, present tense, the things that I petitioned him for. <laughs> Maybe that's the problem. We don't know if he hears us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, proclaimed what is called the New Testament or his will while he was walking the earth, leading and teaching the church. He proclaimed that 
Testament verbally as recorded in the Gospels, other books of his New Testament further define his will as an executor. And that's the legal side of what you don't see when you got saved. But that's what you got. Jesus ascended to the Holy of Holies to complete the deal. He presented his blood on the mercy seat. Man, I, I, I got to pause there for a second. What must that have been like? <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine. <laughs> What, what, <laughs> I think all of creation, the angels that are without number, grew totally silent in amazement as Jesus brought his blood and put it on the mercy seat for us. And he started the next phase of his ministry, which is high priest. He is the high priest of our confession. When we say things according to his will, our high priest goes to work for us. So that's when the new covenant started. It's poured out on man at Pentecost. When Jesus said, it is finished, the old covenant was done. So as a result, God was finished. The veil in the temple was, was, was rent. The old covenant uh, was preparing to be, or the old tabernacle, the old temple, was preparing to be a new one, which is you. Do you understand that? See, there used to be one temple where God's presence dwelt. Now there's a whole bunch of temples in this place where the Spirit of God dwells. A lot of, they went on probably trying to carry on sacrifices and do some old things in a dead way, just like a lot of churches do today, but he ain't there. He is risen. And, and he prepared mankind for a transformation for a new birth. Now, I, I want to say, and I don't have time, next time I preach, if you guys would like, I'll take you into the upper room on the day of Pentecost. There's some things that took place there, but I want to say this to you, and I want you to hear me. Now, there is nobody in this room that believes in tongues more than I do, and I can explain that in another sermon. But the day of Pentecost was not just about tongues. The day of Pentecost was about a new birth. The day of Pentecost was about being the temple of the Holy Ghost. The day of Pentecost was about carrying the glory and spreading the good news of what God was doing to the world. See, a lot of people, they got tongues, and that's the last time you ever heard from them. But God intended more for us. We've been equipped to do something. And he spent 40 days after that, after he raised from the dead, 40 days preaching. You know what he preached? One message for 40 days. He preached about the kingdom. Don't you think that ought to be the thing that we talk about mostly? is the kingdom. Everything he talked about was the kingdom, how it works in our life. That's what the Bible said. He appeared to over 400 and only 120 showed up. That makes me feel better. <laughs> There's been a whole lot of people we spread the word out to and only 120 showed up. But on those 120 that showed up, they got something that they didn't realize was about to happen for them. So he said, go wait in Jerusalem. God's going to fill you. and You're going to become the temple of the Holy Ghost. Endued with power is how Jesus described the infilling. Now, I just want to give you something real important here. Somebody say, why Jerusalem and why on the day of Pentecost? The day of Pentecost was a feast that they had every year. The feast of Pentecost was, was going to draw people from all over the world. And the Jewish festival in the early summer, thousands of Jewish pilgrims from all over the world 
different languages and different cultures all colliding together in that moment. And that's where God wanted to pour out his spirit because he wanted to touch them in such a way to where that message and that experience was going to be spread throughout the whole world. And next time when I preach on, I'm going to take you into the upper room and show you some things that happen. We'll talk a little bit about tongues, too, while we're there. Because, Ben, I'm going to tell you, you cannot believe the power that is behind what God gave us in that treasure. But I'm going to show you what it is. I'm going to show you what it is. And it's going to be good. I'm telling you. So, do you have a need? Do you have a need? Do you ever wonder what the will of God is? Well, I wonder what the will of God is for this. He wrote it down. The Bible said he's given us all things that pertain to life. This is, okay, it's two minutes after 12, but I'm going to read this scripture to you anyway. Second Peter, can, can you pull that up for me? Second Peter. Hold on, I'm getting to it. I want to make sure that I'm in the right one. Hold on, it's in the, old, in the New Testament. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. I'm going to read 3 and 4. I want you to get this. Is that something you can pull up? According as his divine power has given us all things. Everybody say all things. Everybody else say all things. What is all things? He's given us all things. that pertain to life and godliness. So everything that pertains to life and everything that pertains to God has been given to us. How? Through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Where is the knowledge of him? He wrote it in his will. Now, I'll prove that to you because the next verse in verse 4 says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises you might be a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So how are you partaking of that? You're partaking of through the exceeding great and precious promises. What he wrote in his will covers everything that pertains to life, and everything that pertains to God. There's nothing you will ever face that you won't find the answer to in God's Word. Amen. So, you might need to turn off Netflix. And you might have to go ask your mate, where's my Bible? Come on, go get it. Dust it off. I want to find out what his will is. We're having a problem. I wonder what the will of God is. I don't know. Let's go find out. And you've got something else that a lot of people never had before. You have Google. St. Google. And you can pull it up. You can pull it up, and you can go right to that scripture, and you can say, this is what the will of God is. And then once you hear that, then you've got to begin to see it. Once I see it, now I've got to begin to say it. And once I say it, now I've got to have corresponding actions and begin to walk toward it. It's because faith without corresponding actions is dead, being alone. So I just feel like some of you just need to get just a little, just a little feisty. Come on, just a little bit. Can't you get just a little bit, 
just a little bit of an attitude. Come on, just a little bit of an attitude about something that belongs to you. You know, I refer back to the ladies' purses. You may not have anything in there but a fingernail clipper. But let somebody try to go after your purse. You look at them and say, hey, 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 that's mine. <laughs> Why don't you get that attitude about the rest of your life and what God said about you? He's mine, man. I'm telling you right now. He gave me all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. That is his will. And Jesus in his heavenly realm poured his blood on the mercy seat that forever kept mine and God's heart as one. And so I pray, and you know what? He hears me. And when he hears me, I know that I have the petitions that I've desired of him. <laughs> Man, I need to go out and just commit some faith or something. I just, I feel like I need to believe God for something. See, that's a problem. A lot of you guys, you've waited so long since you believe God for anything. That muscle is so weak, you can hardly pick the fork up off your plate. Come on, exercise that. I don't believe God. Well, you don't have to believe it for you. Why don't you believe for that person next to you? They're going through something. Why don't you believe God for them? Glenn Parker came <laughs> when we were on the slab. The E.C. Smith building was nothing but a slab. He came over. We're just talking. And I was looking about that land out there, that 10 acres right next to us. And I said, Glenn, I sure would like to have that 10 acres because we have 10 acres here. I thought, 20 acres, that's, that's pretty good. And he said, well, let's just believe God for it right now. Well, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> so Glenn just reached his hand out toward that land, and he says, it's ours in the name of Jesus. The guy that owned the land, he popped up sometime later and said, you know what, I think I want to just get rid of this thing. Would you guys like to have it? Well, we bought it, but we bought it so cheap, I don't, I'm not even going to tell you how much it was because it's just ridiculous, but it was the favor of God. When's the last time you put your hand out towards something and said, in the name of Jesus? Come on now. And whatever you decree on earth is decreed in heaven. When you decree it on earth, Jesus decrees it in heaven. <laughs> Man, that gives me boldness. I go march in the throne of God, and I say, hey, 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 I'm here. I tell the Lord, be of good cheer, I've arrived. No, I really haven't said that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm excited for your life, for your future, and for what God's doing. And I just encourage you to find the will of God. What did he say? I've given you a whole boatload of stuff here this morning. And I'm just asking that you really just take a moment and try to draw in as much as you can. Why don't you close your eyes with me for a moment, would you? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah, let's do that. He can do all things but fail. Can you do that one? Do you know that song? Jeff, you're anointed of the Lord. You can do anything. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, man. Okay, you... <laughs> you are my champion. You are my champion. You know, I, I've told you this story before, but... When I was in the fourth grade, I was at the schoolyard. Some fifth graders, two of them, cornered me over there. And they was letting me have it. And I went home and got my brother, who was in the seventh grade. And he showed up, and they started using words like, sir. And I'm standing behind him, and I'd stick my head out, and I'd say, yeah! <laughs> He's my champion. 
I don't care what the enemy throws at you. Let me tell you something. Your big brother is more than enough. He's the, and, and he is the baddest dude on the block. That's what Jesus is. Let's sing that. Can you guys sing with us for just a couple of moments?